for last time and the problems with the microphone. I hope that now you can hear me well. If not, could you let us know by typing something in the chat function? Uh, today we have an exciting program with two speakers on two different topics. Uh, so Hub Reinhardt is here and uh, Luke Kravos and Erika Hennip, who is going to support us with the technical issues. Uh, today's program consists of two presentations. Uh, after each of the presentations, we will have a couple of minutes for questions. Um, you can ask those questions via chat function. I see that you are already busy typing things. Audio is fine for me. Great to hear. Um, first, I will give the uh, floor to Hoop Reinhardt, who is a professor in environmental and water technology at Wageningen University. And he will talk about closing cycles by urban greenhouses. Afterwards, Luke Ramas uh, will talk about circularity in urban plant production systems. And he is a researcher at Wageningen University and a graduate of the uh, uh, Technical University in Delft. Mm, I hope that you will enjoy the webinar, and I would like to give the floor to you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Magda, for this uh, introduction. And, uh, well, the, dear audience, uh, it's an honor for uh, me to give a presentation on closing cycles by urban greenhouses. So, I'm a professor here at Wageningen University, and this first slide you see our very nice uh, green campus where also my own research group is located on. The problem we have uh, in our current society is that we are um, not in addition to the pollution, environmental problems, we are also facing problems related to depletion. So there's a problem with depletion of fresh water uh, because of uh, industrial, domestic or ag agricultural use. But there is also a depletion of phosphate, one of the nutrients which is needed um, for our uh, food uh, uh, supply. So a lot of these resources, they are um, related to uh, our use and production of food and in the end end up in uh, all kind of wastewater treatment facilities or waste treatment facilities that are still uh, organized a bit in a conventional way. So we have used water and food residual waste at the one side that goes into the wastewater treatment facility. And then with a lot of uh, energy, we, uh, um, well, we produce nitrogen, we blow that back into the atmosphere, and we create a lot of carbon dioxide also uh, into the atmosphere. And the end result is that we have uh, often uh, water that is not reused, but just put onto a river and often streaming uh, or flowing to, a, uh, uh, to the sea. And in addition, the uh, phosphorus um, and sometimes also partially the nitrogen is uh, ending up in the sludge of these systems and then they are burned and they create a chemical waste. So in this way, we have quite a linear process, uh, taking up resources, consuming a lot of energy, creating pollution and non-reusable products. And we want to change that. Now, how to do that? Uh, we believe, as a professor in technology, environmental technology, that technology is a great part of that. Um, but it's the only thing. Uh, we need to think in systems in a circular uh, resource uh, economy. So the urban system you see here at top uh, produces uh, waste and wastewater. We can uh, implement uh, infrastructure and technology to recover nutrients, carbon, energy, and also recover water uh, without any pollutants. Then we produce clean water, nutrients, and bring them back to agriculture to produce food. And this can uh, then again be uh, uh, flow back into the city. So this 
circular system is uh, the the motive and the the, uh, the red line of our research in our group. So we want to go to no emissions, carbon dioxide neutral uh, system, endless cycles, and we also believe in nature-based technologies and design. Now, um, here you see um, a uh, uh, structure of my own research team. So we have three teams in our group, a biorecovery team, a reusable team, and an urban and industrial uh, system engineering team. And I want to go quickly through all of three of them to show you what type of research we do, which is leading to these urban uh, greenhouse uh, systems. First of all, is that uh, with biorecovery technology, we develop a lot of technology uh, that is related on biology and uh, especially anaerobic technology. Anaerobic biotechnology is often also called fermentation. You see that in the green uh, left uh, part of the figure. Um, these type of technologies they are developed to uh, convert waste into useful uh, uh, other products. A very famous one is biogas. Eh? So you can use uh, uh, anaerobic fermentation to produce methane, and then you can uh, produce from that energy or use it for as a natural gas uh, resource. But there are also other um, applications going on now that we can make bioplastics or polymers out of uh, these uh, systems that can be then used as a resource to make new materials. Another application is the bioelectricity. Uh, uh, so we have uh, biological systems on electrodes, and we bring them in contact with waste and wastewater, and then we produce not biogas, but we produce electricity immediately out of the waste. Uh, and a third variant is biocrystallization. Sometimes they're very valuable uh, products in these waste streams. For instance, phosphorus, but also scarce metals. And we can uh, apply so-called biocrystallization technologies to recover these nutrients or metals from the waste stream. So here you see this fermentation in different uh, variants. So we have... Uh, a uh, pilot called uh, Chaincraft. <coughs> Chaincraft is a uh, company, a spin off of our university that produces out of organic waste long chain fatty uh, acids that can be used to uh, by polymer industry or in uh, the feed industry for uh, uh, enhancing cow, cow uh, livestock feed. Um, Another example is uh, the production of uh, cyophysin, that's a uh, very scarce chemicals produced by uh, algae type of organisms. And another form is wood oxidation, where we, without any burning, we produce heat out of uh, waste wood. And that can then all be applied in the urban environment. So bioelectricity, there is really uh, a lot of uh, technology going on. So we can, uh, instead of uh, producing this methane, we can produce electricity out of organics using these systems. But also, uh, for instance, urine, uh, so or from uh, human urine or uh, urine from uh, livestock, can be used to produce electricity directly out of the waste streams. Um, and on the right hand side, you see a system which can recover ammonium or copper from uh, all kinds of waste streams. <coughs> so this is the, was the, the green part, the bio-recovery part. Let's go now to the blue part, the recovery of uh, water. Um, and what we see in many uh, circular systems that on the left side, you see um, a uh, um, an example of uh, salts and polymers and little particles called colloids that are in wastewater. And these uh, compounds often, often hinder the reuse of the water. So an important part for circular water management is removal of salts 
and polymer and a particular component out of the waste stream. So we have a lot of technologies that are related to that. Another important thing in a sustainable environment is still related to uh, pollution is the cleanup of polluted sites and uh, uh, at industry or urban or uh, polluted sediment systems. Uh, it is a bit of the uh, mitigation of pollution, uh, not part of the, uh, the story of creating a, uh, a circular economy. Another very important topic in reusing water is removal of all kinds of organics and uh, that are harmful. For instance, pesticides or uh, pharmaceutical residues that are in used water. All our domestic wastewater is filled with these type of chemicals on low concentration. Well, the removal of these is very important to make that water available and uh, suitable for reuse in agriculture, for instance, for food production. You don't want to end up your carbamazepine uh, or uh, diclofenac uh, in, and ending up in your tomatoes if you are irrigating with used water. So the removal of these is very important. The same holds with pathogens, uh, organisms that can make us ill. Um, if you want to close uh, water cycles, the removal of these pathogens is a very important topic to have a healthy uh, and clean uh, circular water system. So here's an example of the first technology I showed. It's a so-called membrane capacitive deionization technology. And in that technology, we use electricity to remove uh, low levels of salt out of, uh, out of water, and that is now often applied at industries, but also in, um, uh, in domestic applications in uh, villages that are uh, not connected to the infrastructure of uh, uh, water uh, supply and have to retrieve that water from the subsurface that in delta regions is often impacted with salt. So in this way, we can provide fresh water by applying this technology. Um, the micropollutant uh, issue, as I just uh, briefly uh, described uh, already uh, uh, a minute ago, we have all kinds of different technologies that can be either applied at the wastewater treatment plant, uh, at the drinking water treatment plant, but also uh, all kinds of processes that happen in nature. We can better understand and use to clean water. So we have a big program, as you can see here. Uh, on cleaning groundwater um, by uh, using uh, very special microorganisms that can live in the subsurface and remove all these uh, uh, chemicals that are present in the water cycle at low concentration. So using natural processes and understanding these is also a very important part of creating circular water systems. Now, in the end, um, we, you don't have a single technology which is bringing the solution. Often, there's a whole sequence of different technologies uh, that uh, need to be integrated into designs. And here you see an example of a uh, more physical chemical technology uh, using light or sunlight and a wetland treating the water uh, for, uh, for reuse. So the combined uh, applications are often bringing the solution. And that's where we also focus our research and design on. Here you see that even a bit further developed, uh, wetlands, electrochemical treatments, membrane technologies, all in a sequence to uh, offer uh, a circular water system. And this uh, project is really done in, uh, here in the Netherlands. We have a big program with the industries uh, for instance, companies like Dow, Shell are participating with the same type of approach we also develop in uh, Vietnam, in the Mekong Delta, uh, around industrial parks, or in uh, Bangladesh, where uh, also sustainable water uh, supply is really an important issue. Now, I've shown you uh, the two technology um, lines, yeah, so the biorecovery and also the water technology. And then the next step comes 
how to integrate these technologies into uh, systems. And here you see an example of uh, the three lines of research we have. So we have the urban and industrial modeling and design uh, group that uh, creates models for all these resource flows in uh, systems. Uh, we have also a group focusing on the health of the resources. So for instance, the removal of the organic chemicals and the uh, uh, patents. And we have um, uh, a group working on renewable of urban infrastructure. Uh, because if you don't use the right pipes and the use uh, and, and technologies, in an infrastructural network, you will also not be able to um, uh, have this circular uh, resource uh, system. So, and that's what we try to do. So, you see here a picture. Uh, on the left hand, we have the, uh, yeah, the conventional approach, uh, a linear system, input of resources and waste output, and that's it. You can apply that to industrial systems, but also to urban systems. Here you see the picture of an industry, but we also use uh, this type of systems for urban systems. And on the right-hand side, you see the so-called urban harvest approach or urban and industrial harvest approach, where we minimize the input and minimize the waste output and maximize recovery and uh, um, we have also a uh, program on multi-sourcing. That means, for instance, for water, that you don't only use drinking water as a resource, but also rainwater or brackish water as alternative resources to uh, provide your water supply in a certain region. Now, we apply these things in reality. And um, uh, not only in the Netherlands, but uh, for instance, here you see a very complex picture for a project we do together uh, with Indian partners in uh, Delhi, where we have uh, the urban filter um, uh, of a natural system cleaning the domestic water and making that water reusable for agriculture. So we want to clean the water, keep the nutrients in, that are needed for the agriculture and remove the uh, pharmaceuticals and the pathogens from the water stream. Uh, so this is a running project we also internationally cooperate. Now, if we then go to this infrastructure, we have quite some developments already in the Netherlands. So uh, we uh, uh, built a, um, a block of 250 houses in the city of Snake which is based on the uh, infrastructure which is shown on the left side, this novel sanitation approach. You can see that all the water streams are more or less separated. So we have gray water, you have black water, you have urine, you have rainwater. And all these waters are not mixed, but get separate and individually treated in a way that uh, all the resources can be extracted out of the wastewater and the water is maximally reusable for uh, further use. And this is implemented in these houses in Snake, but also in a building here in Wageningen, in the NEO building. Uh, that's the Institute of Ecological Research, which is located here. And they applied this infrastructure uh, here. And we are further developing this towards uh, further applications. Um, of course, we need to develop uh, all kinds of things. So we have a so-called Green Village uh, project together with our colleagues from the University, Technical University of Delft, where we develop new piping systems and new infrastructures to uh, further develop this uh, infrastructure needed for the circular economy. In the end, we want to uh, combine that and bring that to uh, a real uh, connection to between waste, urban systems, and food. So we uh, have here uh, the so-called uh, the Street of the Future project, uh, which we are developing now uh, in uh, uh, in Amsterdam and in Almere, uh, city cities here in the Netherlands where we implement these type of infrastructures into the houses and in this way we can uh, provide nutrients and water in a safe and uh, sustainable way as input for uh, running greenhouses and uh, produce in the end uh, food 
uh, with that. So it's a waste to food connection. Of course, you have to be very careful in that to uh, address all kinds of health and other issues. But that's the challenge we are working on now. And but maybe it will be the really the uh, the story of the future. Yeah. And to further develop that concept, we are now working together with uh, um, industries and companies and uh, the city of Almere on the Floriade in 2022, um, where we will have a demo of this green uh, street and street of the future project located there and showing that to the, um, well, all the people of the world that want to visit this uh, exhibition on uh, food and uh, uh, what you call it? Now, I showed you uh, quite a technical uh, story, uh, and uh, well, we work with researchers, so you see two of them here. Push the wrong button. No. So Yeah. Oh, I'm there again. Yeah. Audio. Shall I say something? Am I there again? Yes. Yes. Sorry for this uh, intervention. So we had a, te a technical uh, uh, hiccup here uh, with the audio, but it's now restored. So let me continue. Yes, with the um, with the story. So I started to tell. Uh, that we work, of course, with researchers uh, that are studying all these new uh, innovations. So you see two of them here, Ilse Voskamp and Nora Sutton, discussing their research issues. But in many of these situations, uh, we don't work alone. Uh, and now my video doesn't go on. Yeah, okay. Um, so we um, uh, we work also a lot with interaction with uh, with the stakeholders. So you see here in these all kind of circular economy systems, it's really also important to work with the companies, with the municipalities, with the water boards, with the startup uh, pro, uh, companies we issued about uh, making solutions for these type of uh, uh, systems. Yeah, and. That's why we also participate in this uh, in a new institute, uh, the uh, Institute of Advanced Metropolitan Solution in Amsterdam. And this uh, institute is really facilitating the building of these type of living lab programs where we connect sustainable resources to food and to uh, a greenhouse application. So this was a bit my uh, introduction. Uh, to you, and uh, I would be very uh, happy to answer some questions. Thank, Thank you, you for, for your, your attention. attention, and I will wait, wait for the, uh, the questions, questions to come. come. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Hoop. Uh, I have a couple of questions for you. Uh, could you tell what uh, technologies uh, for circular uh, water uh, resource reuse are the most applicable for urban greenhouse? Um, I, I think, think a combination of different technologies. <coughs> uh, um, in many greenhouses, I believe that um, a, a, part, uh, a portion of these technologies are so called nature based, so a kind of constructive uh, wetlands or this type of uh, uh, technologies can uh, do a lot of cleaning of the, of the water before uh, it uh, re enters into the greenhouse system. But in many situations, um, you get uh, in circular system accumulation of salt 
and uh, and these type of uh, uh, components that are not removed by these type of systems. So I think natural greenhouse or uh, wetland-based systems, for instance, in combination with membrane or electro-membrane technologies to remove salt, are uh, are uh, essential in such a, a, a greenhouse application. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so the the question is, uh, if you use plants to clean the water, can you then reuse these plants? <clears throat> and that uh, depends a bit on uh, on the type of uh, processes we apply. So, for instance, we found out that weed plants mm -hmm. can really convert um uh, pesticides and uh, pharmaceutical compounds in their tissues so the uh, wheat plant has a uh, enzyme system which is very much like what we have in our own liver uh, so called p450 enzymes and these enzymes these are used for detoxification of organic chemicals now these plants uh, they uh, convert all the compounds and if they do that then of course you could use these plants again uh, for uh, maybe uh, as feed for cattle or whatever but if you have plants that accumulate uh, these type of compounds and do not convert them then it is uh, very important to investigate the reuse of these plants uh, very very well of course after the water is treated and cleaned and then you grow again uh, plants on it preferentially food or bio-based valuable uh, uh, product then of course there are no limitations at all to any use uh, okay thank you uh, there is a question how is phosphate formed during fermentation and how can the uh, uh, how can this then be used in the nutrient solutions? Uh, okay, phosphate okay. is uh, uh, normally uh, in many processes. Uh, phosphate is uh, reco uh, recovered or retained out of waste streams by, for instance, applying iron or aluminium or whatever. But the end product is that you get a phosphate aluminium or phosphate iron uh, precipitate which is uh, useless it cannot be reused so in these anaerobic fermentation technologies uh, the conditions are in that way that uh, phosphate um, uh, calcium phosphate is formed so um, uh, a kind of uh, material which participates in the interior of the uh, fermentation uh, biogranule and um, uh, calcium phosphate is a very reusable uh, material and uh, when extracted out of the material it's a solid matter and it can then be used as a uh, uh, kind of fertilizer in uh, in agriculture yeah so that's uh, the way we are going for um, i have to be honest in this this is a technology which is underway it's not yet there yeah so another technology which is often used is the so-called uh, struvite uh, precipitation technology out of the solution uh, combining uh, phosphate with magnesium and um, uh, ammonium uh, and make a salt out of that that participates uh, this uh, fertilizer is also uh, this material is also used as a fertilizer but the problem of that is that it is a bit of a slow release compound. So if you uh, bring it uh, to the farmers and they apply it onto the land, the phosphate is slowly released and comes to the slowly available for the plant. So for farming, it's not such a useful product. But for instance, for green infrastructure in the urban environment, it's a very useful fertilizer. So uh, sulfide is already there. It can be applied in practice. The calcium phosphate uh, out of the fermentation is underway, and we hope to develop the technology uh, to application in the coming years. Uh, Great, thanks a lot. 
Uh, you mentioned in your presentation two types of water, gray and black. What yeah. is the difference? Um, well, so I will repeat the question. So what is the difference between gray and black water? Now, black water is in fact uh, the, the water which is coming from the toilet. Yeah, so it's cleaning uh, uh, all the human waste. And gray water is the water which is coming from the from the hand washing and from the kitchen and from uh, the uh, washing machines and so on. So uh, there is no human waste in that uh, gray water, uh, uh, and all the in the black water you have all the carbon and uh, nutrient resources separated. So gray water is very useful to treat. And to make just clean water out of that a resource and black water is a resource where you can recover nutrients and carbon out of the waste stream uh, to make that reusable well thank you and that would be i think the last question what are the main challenges that you see regarding reusing resources in urban greenhouses and, uh, the biggest challenge is to uh, demonstrate these applications for a couple of years that they are really working and then the next step to scale up and scale out uh, yeah, so i think most of the technologies uh, individual uh, bits of, of technologies are more or less uh, close to uh, be uh, applied maybe we can develop uh, a kind of technology but the design and demonstration in reality uh, and that for longer times then showing to uh, people in the cities and to authorities and to companies that is really a feasible solution that is the biggest step for the coming years to do and that's what we also try to do with these living lab programs in Amsterdam to give this uh, uh, an extra boost in that uh, in that program and in that uh, institute. I see one more question. Yeah. Can hormones be fully removed from wastewater, black, grey water? Um, um, so the question is, can hormones be fully removed from uh, black uh, wastewater? And uh, the question is, uh, yes, it, it can be done. Technology-wise, it can be done. We have different applications, and they will be further developed. The problem is, of course, at what cost? How much energy will it cost? And how much resources are needed for that? And is then still the recovery of the resources uh, possible? Uh, but in, pre in principle, <coughs> you can uh, really uh clean these uh waste streams uh completely uh, two more questions regarding uh gray and black water yes. uh, is the current system of separating water waste into black gray urine and rain effective uh yes uh, this uh, system in Snake has been running now, I think, for eight or nine years, <laughs> and it's a very effective system. It is uh, a full operation, and uh, all the uh, how do you say that child diseases are more or less out of the system there, and it uh, has proven to function very well for uh, quite some uh, years. And this concept is now also used. Uh, in other areas in the in the Netherlands, so we have a demonstration project in preparation in Belgium, but there's also a scalar program uh, going on in Canada, in um, Alberta, Edmonton. Uh, so um, yeah, I think the proof of the system is there, and the next step is to scale it up to uh, municipalities and. Uh, uh, organizations that uh, want to uh, invest in sustainable and circular economy approaches. Uh, yes. And the last one? Yeah. Last, <laughs> last question. question. Last question. Yeah. Uh, oh, there is one of that, two more. Uh, okay, we almost have. Almost last question. Yeah. Well, 
where do main economic and implementation challenges lie? So what are the main, uh, what, what, why? Are the... So the question is, what are the main, most economic challenges? Economic and implementation challenges. I think the most, uh, the biggest challenge is the um, social inclusion, social acceptance, or social uh, readiness to adopt such type of applications in uh, the people's own living environment. I think there uh, uh, a lot of uh, effort is still needed, or uh, well, I think the, the, the people, uh, more and more people are going to see that uh, if we continue like this on uh, planet Earth, we will not survive. So more and more people are willing to uh, invest in their own environment to create circular systems. Uh, but uh, to scale that up and to let uh, larger uh, groups of people participate in this approach, that's really the challenge, and I think it's not a, not only a technical or not at all a technical issue. We need uh, also very strong collaborations with uh, social sciences and with uh, architecture uh, um, groups to make a combined effort to uh, to show that this is a really wise and healthy and also nice approach, which is also not mitigating any comfort so many people are also comfort driven so these uh, approaches can also be just as good as the most luxurious uh, infrastructure we are often used to yeah. Yeah. Well, could that be the last question now <laughs> do you still have time for one more question i, I can go, go all evening okay. but, um, i'm not <laughs> sure <laughs> that this is the program <laughs> Uh, is it possible to reduce water consumption by using other matter than water for flashing? Okay, uh, so the question is, would it be useful to use other materials uh, for flushing than water? Well, one of the things we uh, do is, uh, and we have that in this water nexus program I just quickly showed, that we don't use fresh water but we use seawater for flushing. So if you, uh, if you are freshwater limited, but at planet Earth, seawater and salt water is plenty available, you would uh, not waste drinking water, fresh water to flushing toilets, but use salt water, seawater for that. That would be a huge uh, change in uh, water availability in many, uh, especially Delta regions of the world. Uh, and this is a technology we are also develop at this moment in Wageningen, together also with uh, Delft University. And we're making great progress. So in principle, we could start flushing toilets in the near future just using seawater instead of uh, uh, fresh water. So that was the last question. Thank you very much, Hu. Yeah. Um, we will post the recording of this webinar online. Okay. Okay. And if there are some more questions, will you be ready to answer them by uh, writing? Yeah, yeah I, I can. can uh, if, if it's uh, unless uh, there are thousands of questions, <laughs> so, uh, maybe if it's a problem for me, but a few questions, questions I can do. Yes. Thank okay. you. Yeah. And is there any book that you would like to recommend for students who are interested in this topic or any resource? <coughs> uh, yeah, um, what, what I would suggest is that there is a website of my own group where all these circular economy and technology approaches can be found. And uh, I would also suggest to go to the website of the AMS where these things are also listed. So these are two recommendations I can uh, I can give, and I can supply you with the uh, internet addresses so that you can communicate them to other people. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you very much once again. And now I would like to give the floor to Luke. Okay. Enjoy the rest of the lectures. <laughs> bye bye. -bye.
You can go already. Yeah, yeah. Okay. If I... If I... Don't lose that still. Yeah, welcome. Yes, Lee. Yeah. Test. Ja, ja. Ik heb het weinig met het boeken, maar ik vond het echt interessant. Ah, Oké, okay. nou goed. Graag gedaan. Ja. Succes. Ga je het even Test. Ja. Test. Doet hij het? Werkt het? Super. Mooi. Lekker. Ja. Lekker snack. Ja. Ja. Oké. Okay. Goed zo. Kijk, ik zal het ietsje tilten. <coughs> Zo, ja. Oké, okay. start. Can everyone see me? Can everyone hear me? I think it's working, or it should be working. Oké, okay. well, I'm Luc Gramons. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about circularity in urban plant production systems. My background is actually building engineering, and I've only recently started working in Maagningen. Uh, working on uh, plant factories specifically and also on urban agriculture, so different versions of that. Um, my presentation will be a little bit more taking you through all the different phases you can apply in your own student challenge for the design. So I would first like to take you through an introduction of what is urban agriculture. I don't know everyone's background, so I would like to get everyone on the same level in that sense. Then a definition of what I see uh, circularity and sustainability as defined within the spectrum. Then walk you through a couple of strategies, both on energy uh, circularity. The video died, but I think it's back up. Okay, and then at the end, I'll give you a short summary of the things that we've discussed. So first, an introduction in urban agriculture. Why is it suddenly so interesting? What we do see and what a lot of people have uh, written about is if we keep reproducing ourselves in the same speed that we have been for the past couple of years, by 2050, we'll be at 9 billion people. And if we keep producing food in the same way, we won't, simply won't have enough space on this planet to keep producing enough food. Another uh, development that we are seeing is that people are moving more and more towards cities. So we have already had the break-even point where more people are living in cities currently than outside of cities. And this will continue to uh, expand even more and more. So there will be a problem. There will be a large urban food demand and we won't necessarily be able to supply for all of these people living in the cities. So the natural logical leap is that food production has to move towards the cities. There is one major problem, however. I don't know if you ever tried to rent in Amsterdam or New York or London. Cities are very expensive. So if there are so many functions in cities currently, different building functions that are producing a lot of monetary income, whereas agriculture is traditionally relatively uh, low profit, how can we ensure that agriculture can actually be applied in cities? So there are two options. One of them is to limit the amount of space that we actually require for agriculture, zero acreage uh, agriculture. And the other one is to produce very high value crops. So what we had before was cities that were relying on the background of the backland for agricultural production. All of the food was produced here and all of the food was then delivered towards the cities. But the expansion of the cities and people moving towards these cities has pushed these agricultural hinterlands away. So now the goal is to produce a type of growing city where different forms of urban agriculture are introduced into every uh, major metropolis. And urban agriculture doesn't necessarily have to be super high tech. You can have basic backyards producing agriculture. You can have a university allotments, for instance, or even just edible landscapes. And we have a lot of landscape designs already designing these. But what we are trying to focus on, especially in the department in Wageningen, of course, is the more high-tech version. So these are uh, plant factories building integrated agriculture uh, on the walls of, the, of uh, buildings and aquaponics. So these are the high-tech uh, the high-tech applications, and these are the ones that I will also be focusing on today. So all of these have a different impact. They have an environmental impact, an economic impact, and an impact on the health of the inhabitants of these cities. 
So, of course, for the environmental impact, we discussed different types of landscapes. This can really help with the urban heat island effect and create more biodiversity and actually enrich air quality for cities. On the economic side, production always brings with it different types of skill sets that people are now developing. Not everyone can be a banker. Maybe now you can have some growers in uh, these uh, high uh, and expensive cities. And you can create supplemental income and perhaps even lower the costs because you have local production. And for health, of course, we have both the mental aspect of this and the actual physical aspect of this where you can have fresh fruit, fresh vegetables produced very closely. And all of this should lead to more food security in cities. So if we are implementing this in cities, the question is how can we do this in a sustainable and circular manner? So instead of looking at uh, agriculture as an isolated function, we should look at it as being integrated with the buildings surrounding it. So this would create a synergy, actually buildings going back and forth and these two functions exchanging resources. And these resources that we're focusing on now are energy, water, CO2 and waste. So what actually is sustainability and what is circularity? We have a lot of people who are currently um, using both of the terms to sell a vision and the distinction that should be made is that sustainability is ensuring that all future generations can use the same resources that we can circularity is a tool to achieve this is a very advanced method of reusing these resources so that they aren't lost this distinction is very important so if we look at basic basic sustainability the main thing that we have to focus on is smart design. Because if we have a, a requirement of a resource of energy, the first thing that we have to do is lower this requirement by designing it in a smart way. So reducing the actual requirement. Then after that, we have certain waste streams which are still left. We reuse these in the same system, in the same locale to optimize none of the previously produced resources and used resources to um, become dysfunctional. Then, if we apply all of these things, theoretically, the total resource requirement should have been lowered. And there's always a little bit left because you can't reuse everything perfectly. And that last little bit you produce in a, re in a renewable and sustainable manner. If we adhere to all of these principles, theoretically, there shouldn't be any problem for all of our future generations to be uh, sufficiently uh, supplied with the resource that we have currently. Then if we move it towards circularity, we have four principles that we're focusing on. So not just energy, but also our material and on water and on topsoil. The first three, I think everyone knows, topsoil is the functionality of the landscape. So it being able to produce, it being able to uh, deal with the heating of the planet, etc. If we replace this functionality, we have to somehow integrate this back into the city. So if we're building a building, this is no longer area fit for food production, for instance. So could we then integrate that back into the building? And if we're looking at circularity, we're splitting in between two different area sides. So we have on the right side in orange, we have the technical side, which is focused on materials that can be reused in certain stages. I'll go into this deeper later on. And on the left side, we have uh, biological materials, which cannot be used constantly, but uh, or cannot be reused constantly, my apologies, but have a declining level of quality. Again, discuss this in more detail later. So first, circularity of energy. This will focus mainly on an hourly, daily, and seasonally uh, aspect in your design, because this is what uh, we'll, we will deal with in a greenhouse, for instance. So Again, first thing that you do is find out what type of energy you have, what type of energy you need, what type of production you have. So data is very important and monitoring this performance constantly. Then we go through the steps of the reuse, of a reduce, reuse and produce. So again, smart designs, smart, um, uh, smart interventions that reduce the initial demand already. Then reuse all of these sets or all of these flows optimally by linking them with buildings, for instance. And then the end, we produce in a renewable manner. To bridge seasonal gaps, to bridge daily gaps, storage becomes very important for energy in this sense. 
So one of the examples is an integrated rooftop greenhouse, which is a, re a greenhouse linked to a different type of building function. And the building function delivers heat, water, and CO2 to the greenhouse, which is also briefly mentioned uh, in the presentation before. In exchange, food is produced, which can then supply the people living or working in that said building function. And this has been done in The Hague. You might have seen this from urban farmers. They've combined the heat uh, flows of the building and directed these towards the greenhouse. We have different, uh, different examples as well. We have a rooftop greenhouse, for instance, in China. It's a far more uh, isolated, um, isolated greenhouse. And Lula Farm in Montreal, which is relatively famous. This is also an example of a building that is not energetically linked. It is just producing food in an area which originally did not produce food. So the question is, we have year-round production in greenhouses, but can we generate more advantages if we, uh, if we realize this in a city context? One example of such example is uh, the ICTA in Barcelona. This is a research building, specifically also for agricultural research, so it does fit. And what they did was realize four small greenhouses on the top of the building and link this in an energetic way. These greenhouses produce lettuce, tomato, a variety of crops. What they did was initially they designed the roof to already capture rainwater for use in the building itself, but they've optimized this for use in the greenhouse as well. And they try to optimize the use of heat. So this building has to be heated because it's a research facility. And they're trying to grasp the thermal inertia of the building and supply that to the greenhouse at the top. They're trying to use the activity of people in the atrium by warm, they're producing warm air. This rises, they're producing CO2, this rises, and that's immediately linked. And the facade, which warms up and then is linked to uh, the greenhouse as well. So what we see is that actually quite a decent sum of uh, energy is going towards this greenhouse and is saving almost uh, 100 kg of uh, CO2 equivalent per square meter per year. We can also flip this, which hasn't been done yet over there, but we could use the greenhouse as a solar collector. So it's not just the building supplying for the greenhouse, but the greenhouse warming up and supplying the heat in uh, when it's needed to the building itself. Again, storage becomes very, very important. Outside of energy, you have nutrients and water. So what we're trying to do there is how can we link these different flows together? So we have cascades, for instance. If we are using water for the production of tomatoes, at the end, the salinity level will be far higher, so the EC. If we then use it for a crop which has a far higher EC tolerance, we don't have to flush away all of the nutrient solution, we can immediately use it for this new crop. So trying to optimize the use of all of these different things. Another reuse is aquaponics, which I'm guessing a lot of you have read or seen YouTube videos about or anything like that. So I won't go into too much, but in, this is a more advanced version of this. So you're actually combining it with different types of species. So the waste from food production can be used as food for fish. Fish produce waste, physical waste, and that can be reused as nutrients. Of course, to do it properly, you need some systems in between. It can be a direct link. The final example that I want to give you is uh, something that I think a lot of people have heard about as well, which is closed production systems, plant factories, vertical farms, they have different names. Come down to the same thing. Leo Mercedes has talked about this. So is this then the solution? Because you have a fully closed system, you can theoretically reuse everything. So it does lead to high productivity. It does lead to high quality if you produce well and you can limit the amount of pest and it is very efficient. However, this does come at a cost. You have a very low range of products currently, this is still in the development, and the production in these types of systems comes with a very high energy requirement. So what we did is we simulated plant factories and greenhouses in different areas. And what we found was in the red, you can see the high consistent productivity, which is very valuable, of course, for cities. And uh, this amounted to th almost 30 kgs of lettuce per year. And again, if we're stacking this, we have an incredible amount of production. However, what we did find was if we compared the PF plant factory to greenhouses, GH, 
we saw that they were indeed far more efficient in terms of energy because um, you can see it by how far it goes, how many megajoules are required for a kilogram of dry weight production. But in orange, you see the amount of solar energy taken into account. So whereas it is processing energy far more efficiently, the greenhouses are able to use free energy from the sun. And that's what make, gives them the edge. So the second step is materials. Materials, we focus on the longer term. So we've built a design, and then we have a functional and a technical lifespan. The difference between this is that the functional time span is how long this material slash product is fulfilling its function to the utmost efficiency. The technical lifespan is how long the product slash material would actually last. So what we're trying to do is first reduce the need for materials. How do we do this? Smart design. So we're looking at if we design a new building, a new structure, we have different types of functions that could be fulfilled in the same building. So how can we design a building that is capable of housing these different functions? What type of flexibility do we need? So also, what type of dimensions do we need? Do we construct something in a modular way that we can exchange elements and keep changing the building up so they can fulfill these functions? It doesn't have to be demolished and we don't use any of the materials. If we are constructing, uh, constructing modularly, can we also move it to different locations where this function might actually be more applicable now? And last but not least is the technology. A lot of buildings lose their functional edge because they become outdated in terms of technology, because they can be updated. So you should perhaps design a building that can integrate the evolution of different versions of technology seamlessly. If this is possible, it can always stay up to date. Then the question is, we have a building, we've reduced the quantity, how are we going to reuse our materials? So what we discussed before, we have technical materials. With technical materials, we think or we assume that we have a constant quality. So for each iteration, there's no decline in quality. This means that we can keep reusing them. But now we have different levels of reuse, so to say. So first and foremost, we should try to extend the technical and functional lifespan as much as possible just by maintenance. If this is no longer possible, we move to reusing the element itself, so the building element, for instance, a facade panel. After a while, this is also no longer possible. It's no longer functional in the current modern world. So then there might be elements inside that building element that are still useful. So we take it apart. And then all the way in the end, if there are no other reuse options, we reuse the materials itself. For biological materials, it's different. We have a deep grade in quality. Same thing, you can't keep using wood over and over and over again. So what we take into account is that we have an initial quality, and for each iteration after that, it goes down. So we have wood, then no longer useful, we cut it up, uh, make it into a laminated structure, no longer useful, fiberboard, no longer useful, paper, and all the way at the end, we use it for energy production. This is a way how we design with cascades, to make sure that the, that the product is still produced and used optimally. Then the final is how do we produce? So we have to use circular materials. But how, what does this entail? We want to create materials that have a very low energy demand, very low profile, and we want to create materials that can be reused. So in order for something to be reused, the most important aspect is that there are no hazardous materials that would limit this reuse. Then what we're looking at is perhaps we can use materials that have already had a previous life. Then if we don't have those, okay, it's fine. Just make sure that they're produced in a sustainable manner and preferably locally. So you minimize the transport and that footprint that comes across with that. And then in the end, it will be nice if we can gather all of this information in uh, what we call a material passport so that we know exactly what is in a certain product and also exactly how it can be reused later on. So to formulate a type of next life scenario for each and every part. So summary, the most important things are first focus on smart design, reduce the initial requirement, then reuse all of these waste flows as efficiently as possible, 
and uh, produce the final remaining requirements in an energetic and sustainable manner. So what we have, all of these three aspects, and we focus on different lifespans. So we have the total lifespan of the material, total lifespan of the product. We look at the annual lifespan. We look at seasonal, daily, and hourly, perhaps even per minute fluctuations. And we try to gather as much information and try to plan out all of these different uses for all of these different spans. Now, this is a lot. It is a lot to design. It is a lot to think about. You have so many facets. So where do you begin? And the thing is, you should just begin with sketching. Just begin with designing. Everyone has their own approach. Everyone has their own interface that I find interesting. And even though it might seem humble and very haphazard, even these humble beginnings can lead to amazing results. So sometimes you just have to start somewhere. And I would urge you to just start where you love and try to look at as many aspects as possible. Thank you for your time. Okay. I'm not sure if they can hear me, but thanks a lot for your <laughs> presentation, Luke. <laughs> can you hear Marta right now? Uh, say yes or yes, no? apparently yes. Ah, perfect. Okay. okay. We have a couple of questions. Um, I was wondering, uh, what are cutting edge solutions to circular design? Something that you for, for urban greenhouses. Well, urban greenhouses are actually uh, designed relatively circularly because they have uh, a design for disassembly. One of the most important things about designing uh, for the circular economy is designing in a way that you can take all of the elements and all of the materials back out of the design. So in that sense, urban greenhouses are relatively well designed, the current way. Um, if you were to integrate them more into buildings, this would pose different challenges. Okay, thanks a lot. And uh, somebody asked, are there any examples that you could give of urban greenhouses built with recycled materials? Not that I can give. Uh, I was hoping that my colleague Esteban uh, Beza Romero would be here. He's he more of the greenhouse expert. Definitely urban greenhouses, I don't think that there are a lot high-tech greenhouses that have been reused. Most of these uh, examples that I also showed are relatively modern greenhouses. And actually, the production of greenhouses currently financially is relatively low, like the cost for this. So this is why there's not that much focus yet on the reuse of materials. But we hope that with the circular economy, this will change um, because we actually start seeing materials as resources and buildings as storage places of resources, as opposed to something that's just at the bottom line, OK, how much does it cost? Hey, thanks. Uh, another question. Uh, do you need to use any other fertilizer if you are using aquaponic systems, or can they provide all the uh, nutrients that you need? Typically, you would need additional fertilizers, just because no system is perfect, and uh, you also have to process the waste from the fish into proper nutrients. This is more based on now I have to say this correctly, that you have to um, purify the different version, the, the different nitrates from the fish waste to uh, serve as a fertilizer for the plants. But not every, uh, not every uh, fertilizer component is in the waste itself, so you always need a hybrid system. Okay, thanks. Uh, you talked about material passports. Is it a common practice? Are there any buildings that already have this kind of passports? Um, yes, there are. It's uh, currently really under development. You have different stages of how specific these are. The material passports are usually linked to building integrated modeling, BIM. And where this has been applied, for instance, is the ABN Emerald Pavilion uh, called Circle in uh, Amsterdam. I would urge everyone to visit that if you're interested in circular uh, developments and circular constructions. And um, Thomas Rao is also working on a couple of versions, but there's not one uh, typical material passport yet. This is still being developed and usually, like I said, is linked to BIM. Okay, yeah. is it? 
Is there any website where you could find examples of such passports? Or? Most people are trying to keep this to themselves a little bit to make some money off of it. But uh, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation has a lot of uh, basic versions of material passports. So these could be interesting. Uh, you also have uh, Circular Economy, which is a Delft uh, uh, original company, which is, uh, could be interesting. And uh, the, also the ABN AMRO Circle website has a lot of um, insights in how this project came to be. Uh, thanks. Uh, you talked about cascade, cascading water. Can you also cascade energy in that way? Yes. Uh, this is actually, uh, if you're interested in this, I would research exergy, so with an X as opposed to an N. Uh, these are different levels and qualities of uh, energy. So it doesn't only have to do with temperature, but also different. So for instance, uh, electrical energy is of a higher exergetic value than uh, temperature than heat energy uh, because it's, it's more easily converted and it still has different options and naturally the most basic thing you can do is start with a high temperature use this for a specific function it loses some of its energy slightly lower temperature use that for a specific function etc that's the most basic version XG is a little bit more uh, in depth but definitely if you're interested have a look at XG. okay thanks and if you would about to design an urban greenhouse and there is an existing building in, at that, in that location what would be more uh, better from the circularity point of view to reuse this building or to develop new one which is very floral full thought from the very beginning about closing the cycles if you are only focusing on a rooftop greenhouse my suggestion would be that you would keep the existing building. Um, this is because a lot of these systems, if you do have the rooftop space, of course, this is initial selection. A lot of these systems, especially of existing buildings, um, pump all of the excess energy into the immediate environment. It's actually relatively suited to reroute this to a greenhouse, of course, with an intermediary system. If you were to design a full vertical farm, my opinion would be uh, to focus on close production. Because if you're interested in optimizing natural daylight entering into these systems, it's quite difficult to work with existing buildings. So for that specific goal, if you want a fully natural production, which I would not recommend because there's not that much sunlight actually entering, um, you might want to consider a new building but in terms of circularity reusing square meters that you have already built typically trumps building new square meters and in your presentation you showed a, a kind of comparison between urban greenhouse or like a greenhouse and a vertical farm so without sunlight uh, in the colder climates where there is do you still see an advantage of a, of, uh, of a greenhouse uh, or, or is this uh, advantage much, much smaller than in other climates? You can go back to that one. To, I'll show you specifically if that's possible. So quick. Ah, here. So um, Sweden, that one, uh, the one at the top, that is actually the north of Sweden. Mm -hmm. So what we saw there is that this was relatively close to approaching these are just the loads, not the end electricity use, but with loads and with electricity use that it started to become closer and closer to uh, plant factory energy use per production. So the amount of heating that you're losing uh, was starting to weigh up for the lack of solar energy entering. However, we still found that the greenhouse was far more productive. And especially if you look at greenhouses with artificial lighting, so actually adopting elements of closed production systems, and those were even more efficient. We found out that in the uh, United Arab Emirates, or Abu Dhabi, where you have a lot of heat gain and you need a lot of cooling, these also became quite close. So you saw that the plant factory and the greenhouse became relatively close uh, in the energetic performance. So it either has to be that you're gaining far too much energy or that you're losing far too much energy. However, in both of these locations, which are quite cold and quite warm, 
uh, we did not find that the greenhouse could outperform, or we did not find that the plant factory could outperform the greenhouse, energetically speaking. With all other resources taken into account, they are outperforming greenhouses. So they are more water efficient, they are more CO2 efficient, and they are more space efficient. The plant... Uh, the plant factory, yes. More, yeah. The vertical farm plant factory. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned quickly uh, the double skin on the building. What is the technology behind it? Uh, a, a climate facade. Um, what yeah. you would do normally is you would create a double skin that can either be used for... Um, normally what you would do is you would have it open and closed at the bottom and at the top of the double skin. If you have it closed, you create a thermal buffer. So. Uh, this is almost like an extra insulating layer. You can also open it, and because of the sunlight hitting it, it will create a natural thermal flow. And this could be used to either um, extract the used air from the building itself, or also for a slightly cooling effect. This is normally what a uh, climate facade is used for. This one, however, in particular with, uh, with Barcelona, which you can go to, uh, is linked to the greenhouse itself. So what you see here with this double skin facade is that the air is warmed up and then enters the greenhouse at the top. So you have a relatively warm air already entering the greenhouse. Okay, great. So now the last question. Um, is there a building that you would recommend stu students to study if they want to learn more about circular, uh, circularity and closing the cycles in the building? For circularity of construction or for circularity of closing the resource cycles, so the more brief uh, moments. For circularity of construction, I would focus on, uh, again, the ABM Pavilion Circle, which is quite a nice uh, example. Uh, for closing nutrient flows, it depends on what you're looking for. One very interesting uh, example which also links to the previous presentation, is at the Green Village, where you have Pré uh, This is a typical Dutch row house redesigned. Also, I can reuse different uh, energetic flows mainly, and also some water flows. Um, we have different examples of large-scale uh, office buildings. The Edge comes to mind in Amsterdam, which works on this very well. And the works by Norman Foster, in my opinion, also uh, typically focus on reuse of resources. Okay, thanks a lot. And uh, that was it okay. for tonight, for this evening. Uh, so I would like to close it now. Uh, thank you all for participating and for all your questions. Uh, as with the other webinar, the recording of this session will be soon available on one of the playlists uh, of, the, of the last week, actually. I will send you the link soon. Erika is going to also send you soon uh, um, a link where they can, when you can provide a feedback. And don't forget that there is a webinar. Okay. And don't forget that there is another webinar tomorrow. It's not organized by Wageningen University, but by the Technical University of Eindhoven. So I will not join you there. <laughs> Uh, but I hope uh, you will have a lot of, uh, well, it, that it will be an interesting uh, webinar. I have sent you a link uh, to that webinar, to register for that webinar already some time ago. If you cannot find, me, uh, find it, then just please let me know right now, and I can still provide you that link again. Uh, and our last webinar will be next week, Tuesday, and I will also soon provide you the link to that one. And that will be on a very different topic, so social aspects of uh, design, uh, designing urban greenhouses and embedding it in the local structure. So I would like to close here, and I wish you a very nice evening. Bye.